Amen, amen, amen. Um, we are in uh, Psalm 23. It is the... Um, it is the most popular psalm written in the book of Psalms. And as soon as we start to read it, you're going to recognize some of the words. You probably grew up listening to it um, or listening to it, hearing it, reading it. Um, here's Psalm 23. I'm just going to read it right to you guys. Here we go. Verse one, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That, that first section is one picture. He's the shepherd and we're the sheep and he cares for us. Psalm 23 is two pictures. That's the first one. The second one is we are at the banquet of the king and he takes care of us. Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the king of the Lord forever. Two pictures. In both pictures, we're the ones in need. In both pictures, he's the one who takes care of us. Amen? Amen? And we are blessed by that. Here's our verse today. We're going to do Psalm 23, verse 3b. Now I'm putting that B out there because we're doing the second half of that verse. So last week, Pastor Ricky did the, the fact that the shepherd uh, lays us down beside green pastures, right? So we can, we can eat the grass, right? And then he leads us beside quiet waters so that we can drink and everything is about rest and he restores our soul and that's all good and restful and all of that. This next picture, after he's restored our souls, he's going to guide us on right paths. Now, why the B? Because I'm only doing the second half of this verse. You're like, well, that's weird. Here's why. All right, so the original scripture that you have in your hand, when it was in Hebrew, okay, when it was originally written there, it did not have chapter breaks and verse breaks there. So all those numbers that you see, those are tools that we use today just so that we can all navigate to the same place and read the same passage. But just like a little Bible student note, you need to know those numbers weren't there in the original. And sometimes you're going to be reading along in your Bible and you're going to be like, I wouldn't have put the chapter break there. Good for you. <laughs> that part is not inspired by the Holy Spirit. The rest of it is. Amen? 3B. So he leads us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. Two really big phrases. And we're going to spend all of today on those two phrases and how they make sense to us. He leads us. He guides us in right paths or good paths or straight paths. Your, your different versions might say different things about that word because the translators just weren't sure. It's good paths. It's not Passive righteousness is okay, but that word righteousness there might imply to many of you, if you grew up in the church, moral righteousness. The original word did not imply morality. The original word just implied this is a good path. It's a good path. It's a straight path. It's a safe path. It's a peaceful path. It's a path God wants for me. Good path. He guides me. He is my guide and he does it for his namesake. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on for his namesake. And I'm going to do this part because I really don't want to do this part. I'm going to do this part um, and I'm going to do it relatively quickly because for some of you, this, this might be your hang up in the verse. And so I want to give it just enough time. We're going to spend most of our time on God's paths for us, but for his namesake, for just a, for just a second. So he's going to guide us on good paths for the sake of his name. It's the only moment in Psalm 23 where God's motive and reason for his actions is given to us. What's God's motive? Well, he's doing all this for the sake of his name is what the writer of Psalms, probably David, is saying here. For the sake of his name, for the sake of his reputation, the sake of his good name, Yahweh, Jesus, for the sake of that name that we could trust that name, God is doing all of these things. And this is going to mess with us just a little bit for the sake of his name. Why would God do stuff for the sake of his name and reputation? That might sound on the surface selfish to some of you. Let me put it this way. Some of you guys had a grandma or a grandpa who followed Jesus 
followed him deeply and found him faithful across her whole life, right? And maybe it was a parent or maybe it was an aunt or an uncle to you, but you've got some hero of the faith and you saw them walk the walk with Jesus and you saw that as proving that he's trustworthy. Anybody have a story like that? Most of us do. Most of us are following God today because we saw somebody else follow God and he was faithful to them. So he did this thing and he gained a reputation in our family or in our neighborhood or in our school. Whatever it was, we came to trust him because he was trustworthy. So God needs to do things that are trustworthy, amen? Parents need to do things that are trustworthy so that their kids will trust them. So that's part of what God is saying. And some of you might still be struggling with it. And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But is that his big reason? Is that his big motive? Because other parts of scripture talk about other motives for God, right? Like John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave us his only son. So the reason God sent Jesus is because God loved us. Well, that's a motive too. And that verse talks about the motive as if that's God's only motive is love. So which is it? And then just to bake your noodle just a little bit more, we come to uh, passages like 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, where it talks about agape love. And it describes in detail what God's love is actually like. And one of the qualifications for God's love is that it never seeks its own. Amen. It's never selfish. So as God seeks to protect that reputation so that others might trust him, he's doing it in a non-selfish way. You baked yet? Right? Like, here's, here's a verse that kind of puts it all together, I think. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Look at this. In love, God predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Now that's a Bible verse with a lot of Bible words, amen? There's a lot going on in that verse. Like some of us are spinning already. Here's what I want you to see. Ultimately, Jesus died for us because God made a plan to save us and bring us into his family. That's what that verse is saying. But in the midst of him just doing that simple thing of saving us through Jesus and bringing us into the family, God has motives in that verse. Did you see him? Let's see him. In love, God predestined us according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. Now that's at least three motives in that verse for God. And there's probably more if you look closer. Number one, why did God do this for us? Why did Jesus save us? Because God loved us, number one. Because number two, God had promised to. It was his will and it was prophesied that he would. And then number three, he did it so that we would praise him and he would be glorified, i.e. we would trust his reputation. Amen. See, as humans, we look at everything binary. Like it's, it, it's gotta be either this one or this one. It's all the above. Amen. God is so brilliant. God is so brilliant that every single action that he takes is simultaneously in line with his character. It is for his glory and it is out of love for us. Amen. It's, he's just that good. Okay, we done with that part? Let's talk about paths. Let's talk about guidance. Let's do that. Um, so he, he guides us on right paths for the sake of his name. He guides us on right paths, not bad paths. Not dangerous paths, even though it might feel that way to us at some point. He guides us. And, and, and what's implied there too is that he keeps us moving. Do you notice that? Like Ricky's verse, like he got us to these green pastures and the quiet waters. He's restoring our soul and everything is nice and Sabbath and rest and it's all wonderful. And then he says, it's time to move. Pastor Jack Hayford one time said, the sheep don't complain until someone makes them move. Isn't that true? right? Like once we find a good spot, don't you just want to sit there forever? Yeah. And then God, so annoying, he comes along and says, let's move. Because that's what he does. He guides us on right paths because we need to move. There's a, a book somebody gave me last week. One of our life group leaders here, one of our new life group leaders gave me this book and a uh, beautiful book. And it was written by this guy named uh, W. Philip Keller. 
And his story is, he's a Bible teacher, but before that, for years, um, he actually owned his own sheep farm for eight years. And he actually lived this life as a shepherd for real. And so when he came to Psalm 23 and he was writing about it, he's like, you know what? A lot of us don't understand what's really going on in this Psalm because we've never lived the shepherd life. I asked for people to raise hands for a service if they'd ever owned a sheep before. And I totally expected there to be zero hands and there was like five hands. So (laughs) congratulations, Oklahoma. But (laughs) yeah, just amazing. But anyway, for the rest of you who haven't owned sheep before, um, I think that hits a little bit, doesn't it? Like we're reading about this and it feels like good, beautiful poetry, but what does that actually mean to us? So he came to this spot and he was talking about him, the fact that God guides us on right paths. And he's like, you've got to make sheep move. And he's like, and the reason is, is because sheep want to stay and sheep will decimate the pasture that they're in if you let them because they'll eat the grass and they'll just keep eating. They'll keep eating right down to the roots and they'll actually decimate the entire area. He said there was a, the phrase that they used was they said, you could walk up to a pasture and say, that pasture has been sheeped to death. Because they will, they'll, they'll go right down to the roots and nothing will be able to grow back. And every path that they walk, they'll just keep walking that same path over and over and over again. If you let them, it'll create deep ruts and then the rains come and everything's a mess. He also talked about disease and, 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 and microorganisms and insects that would come along and, and, and do damage to the sheep if you left them in that spot for too long. You just had to keep them moving. So he gave this quote. He said, the greatest single safeguard which a shepherd has in handling his flock is to keep them on the move. They dare not be left on the same ground too long. So God comes along and says, and now I'm ready to guide you on right paths because we need to move to the next pasture. Make sense? Amen. There's, there's all these parallels to us in the way that we work with God. He never lets us sit still. And some of us really want him to leave us alone. Right? We found a good spot, Lord. But he's going to move us. And when he moves us, he's going to move us on good paths. Because he knows where the next good um, grazing ground is. And he's not going to lead us off a cliff. He's not going to lead us into the wolf's den, right? He's not going to get us lost because he knows. And he's going to keep us moving. And if we were left to ourselves, we would go right into the wolf's den, right off the cliff. Yes, we would get ourselves lost and we would never move in the first place. If left to ourselves, that's what we would do. Last week, um, when Ricky was giving his message again on Sabbath and on rest and the restoration of our souls, he gave um, what I think is probably the best story of this entire series. Nothing's going to top it. Um, but it was his friend Colin who was growing up in the bathtub. Do you guys, were you here for that one? Um, so I'll, I'll retell it just a little bit to catch the rest of you guys up. So Colin's a little kid and his dad sends him in to have a bath and to fill the, the tub with water and he overfills it. And the, the dad says, go empty the tub. And, and all of a sudden minutes later, you could hear Colin crying from inside the bathroom. And the dad walks in and Colin has been trying to drink the thing dry and he says, I can't dwink no more. <laughs> it's a great story. Just pull the plug, Colin. Like we all get it, but isn't that just, it's a picture of our human condition. Is God has the way that this whole thing works and we kind of want to ignore God's way of how this whole thing works and we want to do it through effort. Yep. We're just going to drink more. And it's, it's what we tend to do. And so we looked at how that applied to Sabbath last week, the fact that we want to overwork ourselves and God wants us to rest. Could we just trust God and his plan and his rhythm for life? That was all last week. But the more I thought about it, and I'm sitting in this chair thinking about this message for this week, and I'm like, it's not even just about Sabbath. It's about every single path in your life. It's about everything with which you use to shape your life. A lot of times we're doing it in the wrong way, not God's way. We're doing it our way, according to our intelligence, not what he's told us to do. And as such, we're like little Colin, exhausted and hopeless. Who's exhausted and hopeless today? Don't raise your hand. But I know, like we've all been there, right? On everything. 
And so the call today is walk God's path, not your path. Done, let's pray. Just joking, we've got more. But before we go further, just stop and embrace for just a second. If you've been sleeping up until this point, get this. The pain that we're experiencing in this life often is the direct result of the fact that we have chosen our own path. And we have resisted God's path. And because of that, we are exhausted by our own designs and we are hopeless about how we're going to get free. Isn't it great news that the good shepherd is here today to offer us a better way? So understand the path. So, so at, the more I thought about Colin, the more I thought about our life and the way that we shape our life and all these paths, um, I, I, I kind of broke it down in my mind into these two pieces. It's either a me-shaped path is my life or it's a God-shaped path, right? Like right there. It's like, it's one or the other. And that is often the true binary of our lives, right? Like we choose Jesus or we don't. We choose the great shepherd or we don't. And it's like, yeah, are, are, are there thousands of little choices? Of course there are. But ultimately we come to God and we say, you are my shepherd and you are in charge or you're not. Or I'm the one who's in charge. And that's fundamentally what changes a life. Because like Ricky said last week, I keep referring to Ricky over and over again. Sorry about that. Um, but last week he reminded us that all throughout Psalm 23, everything is God. Everything's the fact that God takes us to the green grass. God takes us to the water. God restores our soul. God's the one who guides us on the right path. There's not a lot of talk about us, but we have to let him do his thing. We got to let him. And man, we fight him, don't we? So let's, let's do this uh, comparison just a little bit deeper. So um, the me-shaped life and the God-shaped life. So first of all, I've got to discover what my life is, and I've got a way of discovering that. So in the me-shaped life, I've got to discover what it is that I believe, which is probably the most important one on that list. What do I believe about myself and my own identity? What do I believe about God? What do I believe about the world? What do I believe about everything around me? What do I believe? Who decides that? Do I decide it? Or does God decide it for me? It's a big question. Next in discovering, what, what's my purpose? What am I here in this life to accomplish as a person? Well, who gives me that purpose? Does God give it to me or do I decide it myself based on my ACT scores and all the other things? Do I decide it? What about my career? What job am I supposed to do in order to make money? And what kind of income level am I supposed to have? What kind of education should I reach? Like how many degrees are too many degrees or not enough degrees? And which degrees should I choose? I got three, three kids all doing this college thing right now. Like who decides for you? And who decides if you succeeded? You or God? It's, there's only two. Um, marital and family status. Do you get married? Who do you get married to? Um, do you have kids or not have kids? How many kids do you have? What kind of family do you have? Do you decide that or does God decide it? Do you see it's, he, he, he's guiding us on right paths for his namesake or am I guiding myself on my own paths? It's, it's one or the other, A se sexual preference. Who do I get to sleep with? Who do I wanna sleep with? Am I deciding that or is God deciding that for me? What's, what, what gender do I embrace for myself? Do I decide that or does God decide that for me? What about my political team? Don't assume you're on the same political team as me. Don't. Who decides my political team? Who decides what pundits I believe on TV? Who decides which pundits I hate on TV? Oh, I got quiet now, right? Again, it's not about you necessarily embracing all the political beliefs of your pastor or of your parent or your grandparent or anybody else. It's about, do you go to God and say, God, you make sense of it for me. Amen. See, that's the difference. Yeah. On every single one of those things, I'm not trying to give you a pre-described a, a pre list or a prescribed list of what it is that you're supposed to believe and do with your life. I'm saying, go to the shepherd. Go to the shepherd. Have you learned the skill of going to the shepherd? 
Because he's trying to guide you. But do you go to him? Mm. When I grew up, I was raised in a Christian home. And there was, a, there was a sense, okay? It was just a sense. I'm not blaming anybody for this. It was just a sense of like, if we can raise our kids and if they don't get anybody pregnant and if they don't come out as gay and if they don't do drugs and if they don't go to jail, then we can say we Christian parented well. It's even more quiet. Yep, I know. I know. And some of you are raised that way. And you felt like you checked those boxes for your parents and now you're good. Confrontational, isn't it? And you can do any of those things, by the way, once you're an adult and you're outside of our home church and blah, blah, blah. But don't do those things. Where did we get that list? Where did that even come from? And the problem with that list is it starts to turn God into a moral judge who cares about your moral image and what your moral image individually conveys about his moral church. He's not that. He's a shepherd. Yes. He's a shepherd who loves you, died for you, wants to guide you. Oh, we're really baking you now, aren't we? Every person in this church, I had that list. Could I have that list back up? Every person in that church is me shaping part of that list. And some of you are convinced that you're a good Christian today because you're, you're letting God shape some of the key ones up there for you. That's not Christianity. It's just not. Jesus is Lord. That's Christianity. He died for you, but he's Lord. That's Christianity. Not only do you have to discover it, but you also, you also have to win it. So whatever you decided that you are, how your life is shaped, <laughs> the hard part isn't done. Now you have to do the thing, right? Like whatever degree you've said you're gonna do, whatever marital status you're gonna aim for, all the things like you now have to do all of that stuff that you said you would do. And man, that's some pressure, isn't it? What happens when you fail? Well, if you're the one who decided the, the trajectory you were on, if you fail, it's kind of your fault. But if God's the one who shaped your life up front and then you fail, well, how do we define failure now? Because maybe you didn't hit all the marks, but did you seek him? Did you love him? Did you let him come in and speak and guide you as best as you possibly could? And then did you let Jesus come in and cover every other place where you failed? It's a completely different formula. This one, when God shapes it from the beginning and God defines what winning or success or, or fulfillment looks like for you, it actually leads to peace. Why? Because he's good. He's kind. He will be merciful toward you, more merciful toward you than you will be for yourself. Now, what do you do with your limits while you're trying to shape and form your life? What about your limits? What about your limited IQ? What about your attractions? What about your job prospects based on where you were born and all the things that come together? What about that? What about those limitations? What about your ability to have children or not have children? What about your mental health struggles? Some of your mental health struggles that feels like only you have and nobody else has. See, it's all wrapped up in here together, right? Because if I'm the one who's trying to form my own life, then all of a sudden these limitations become a real problem for me, right? Like I've got to fight against them. I've got to fix them. I've got to deal with them in my own strength. But if God is forming my life for me, then I'm coming to him with my limits and I'm saying, God, this is, this is hard. God, I want you to change this. You ever go to God and pray like that? God, I would, we, I, we can't have kids, but I would really like to have kids. Right, like this other thing is broken, but God, I would really like you to fix this. 
And we go to God and there's something about that relationship that just builds trust with him and makes us deeper with him. And then sometimes he grants it to you like he granted it to Abraham and Sarah. And it's a miracle when he changes your limits and it's a beautiful thing and you've got a testimony. And sometimes it's not that testimony. Sometimes the testimony is, and then God said, my grace is sufficient for you because my power is made perfect in weakness. And he says, no. And he said, that limit you're going to, you're going to continue to experience. And that's the way that you're going to see Jesus in this life the best way possible for you because I love you. It's not a punishment. That limit is, is part of my plan for you. It's part of the path. And when God gives you a hard word like that, and you have to walk the road of acceptance with him, that's a lifelong road. And that's a difficult road. That's not an easy road. Can I get an amen? Amen. That's a difficult road to walk. But dealing with my limitations, it changes in a God-shaped life. Dealing with the opinions of others changes in a God-shaped life. What do I do with my parents who don't agree with my decisions? What do I do with my friends who don't agree with my decisions or my political team that doesn't agree with this aspect of my belief system? What do I do with all of that? It's very, very different in a God-shaped life versus a me-shaped life. And then finally, What do I do about passing my own character along to others and influencing others? There are a whole lot of people in this world that are influencing others and they haven't stopped and asked themselves the question, should I be influencing anybody? (laughs) Right? Are you sure you should duplicate you? (laughs) It's a valid question. And we're going to have kids and we're going to influence our friends. We're going to influence on social media. We're going to influence the students that we have in our life and the employees that work at our business. We're going to influence all these people. Stop and ask yourself, am I going to reproduce something good? Because in the Christian world, the answer to that question is, if you're following Jesus, then what you can reproduce is following Jesus. The Apostle Paul said that in the New Testament. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. You know what he didn't say? Don't follow me in the places where I'm not following Christ. But that's what he meant. Follow me as I follow Christ. To the degree that you can see me aiming toward Jesus and seeking him with my life, follow that part of me, please. And that's the part we can feel good about passing on to our kids and everybody else. Enough about us. Let's talk about Jesus, amen? Let's talk about him. Let's talk about his shepherd nature. Four points about the shepherd nature of Jesus I want you to know because if you actually decide today that I wanna go on this God-shaped life and I'm gonna give him the the right to come into every single one of those things and tell me what to do, which is totally anti-culture, by the way, totally different than the way you've been raised. It goes against everything in your nature to to give the wheel to Jesus right? It goes against everything. But if you're going to do that, who is this Jesus I'm giving control to? So let's talk about the way he's going to do this with us. Number one, he's the way, not the map. So you're going to either find this joyful or infuriating depending on the day. John 14, 6, Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. He's not the map. Why is he not the map? Because a lot of times we go to God and we're like, I would like the next 95 steps typed out, please. (laughs) And I'd like to read the rest of this novel and I'd like it in triplicate, right? Like I would like all of that so I know where this is going and I know what the next steps are and so that I feel in control Right? We want a map from God. Absolutely. He's like, I'm a guide. I'm your shepherd. I'm going to walk right next to you. And I might tell you what's going on in the next 20 feet or so, but that's it. Why? Because he's interested in there being this trust relationship between us and him. He wants to walk with us. Right? You, he hands you a map and guess what you start trusting? You trust the map, not God. You trust your control, not God. He's he's interested in building that love relationship with you. So he's the way, not the map. Next, Jesus 
shepherd nature thing is Philippians 2.13. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. So he helps you walk it. So there's this whole thing going to be overlaid across this whole idea of like, we're going to give God the, the place of lordship in our lives and say, you shape my life. You, you guide me and I'm going to trust you. And in the midst of all of that, we're going to fail, right? We're, you, you know it, like, you know from the Christian life, you can't do it, right? Because you've tried. And if there's anything you can fail at, you've already failed at it probably. So have I. So I need his help every step of the way, right? I need him to motivate me and I need him to help me follow through. That's the desire and the power. God is gonna be there helping you every single step of the way, actually follow him. As soon as that little switch in your heart changes from I wanna run my life to I actually wanna invite Jesus in to run my life, you're gonna find that his power comes in and he's gonna help you. So the next thing, he forgives when we wander off. Isaiah 53, 6, I love this verse. All of us like sheep, here's sheep again, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own path. Yet the Lord laid on him. Who's him? That's Jesus. The Lord laid on him the sins of us all. That's the cross. So what he's saying is back in Isaiah in the Old Testament, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, God is like, the nature of my sheep is you all tend to wander away onto your own paths. And so Jesus is going to die for that. And he's going to pay the cost for your guilt for that and for your shame for that. And when Jesus pays for that, you've got the option to be reconciled to God. So God knew it was coming and he forgives you. And he didn't just forgive you once. Some of you Christians in the room, you got saved and you know you were forgiven then and then you deal with guilt for the rest of your life. That was never God's will for you. Jesus keeps forgiving you every single day, every single moment, every single decision. And we need it. He forgives us. Last thing, he walked the path first. Philippians 2, 7 Jesus, this is describing Jesus coming from heaven and being born in Bethlehem, becoming a person, right? It says, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient. So that's, that's, that's just Bible speak for he, he left his path behind, right? Like he left his agenda He left his power. He left his glory. He left all of this stuff behind and he became obedient all the way to death, even death on a cross. So this, this, this picture that we're, we're trying to embrace here in Psalm 23 of like, we follow God for life. Every single step of the way, everything that he tells us to do, Jesus did it first. So the same Jesus that's trying to help you understand this and calling you to follow him, he did it. He was obedient. It's easier to follow somebody who's walked in your shoes before. There was a guy named Ed Meyer and Linda and I knew Ed Meyer. Um, He's a pastor, Ed Meyer, wonderful, wonderful man. Like the most tender, merciful man you've ever met in your life was Ed Meyer. Um, he's not alive anymore, but we got to know him. He kind of pastored the two of us when we were dating. And, um, this incredible guy who like knew the Bible inside and out, just no matter what you asked him, no matter what the question was or what you were struggling with, he always brought it around to mercy somehow. And it's just like, you just, you loved to hear him speak, right? Because he just, he exuded love and mercy so much. And you could just sit there with the guy all day. This is pastor Ed Meyer. And, um, one day he's telling us a story and he's like, he had grown up in a Christian home and then he had kind of loved that environment so much that he had gone to seminary and then he had become a pastor and he had been a pastor for years. And all of a sudden, one of his fellow pastors invited him to a Billy Graham crusade and he went to a Billy Graham crusade and he heard the gospel and he went forward and he got saved That messes with you, doesn't it? It messed with us. Wait, wait, wait. What do you mean? What do you mean you can grow up in the church? What do you mean? What do you mean you can like go to seminary and you can, you can know the Bible as well as you do and you can be a pastor? 
You get paid for it. Like a, and, and lightning bolt never struck you at any point in that whole process. And then suddenly you heard the gospel clearly for the first time and you got saved. What does that mean about all the rest? Hmm. We can, we can, we can have a relationship with a local church that we love. We can like the teachings of Jesus. We can see ourselves as the God team versus the world's team. We can do all those things, guys, and never yield our souls to Christ for real. And never get it. Intentional silence. Just letting you think on that. It's big stuff. It messes with us. Can I, let me read this to you. This is Luke 6, 46. Because Jesus talks about people who are stuck in this exact spot. He says, why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, when you don't do what I say? I will show you what it's like when someone comes to me and they listen to my teaching and then follows it. It's like a person building a house who digs deep and lays the foundation on solid rock. And when the floodwaters rise and break against that house, it stands firm because it is well built. But anyone, this is the other side. Anyone who hears Jesus' teachings and doesn't obey is like a person who builds a house right on the ground without a foundation. And when the floods sweep down against that house, it will collapse into a heap of ruins. It's a really simple parable from Jesus right there. And he's like, the hard reality is there's a lot of people who call Jesus their Lord. But they don't follow him. Because when it comes to all those decisions, they make it for them. They make the decision according to what they want. They shape for their own life. Sinatra, I did it my way. Right. It's not a new idea. People have been doing this for a long time. See that in the words of Jesus. People have been doing this for a long time. It's a scary verse because they all called Jesus Lord. It's a scary verse because he said, you've heard my teaching. And you know what he's implying there? Is he's implying church people because who are the people who've heard his teaching? That's church people. So you call me Lord and you're sitting under my teaching, but then you walk out those doors and you live your life exactly how you want to live it. I know that's confrontational. The difference, he says, is do you surrender for real? Would you guys stand? He guides me on right paths for the sake of his name. <clears throat> Don't get confused today. You read about all the, the great heroes of the faith throughout the scripture and the ones who yielded themselves to God for real, they were still a mess. Their life was a mess and their family was probably a mess, right? Right? Don't, don't take a message like this and start, start judging the moral perfection of your life. It's not the point. The point is, do you really surrender your life to God? Is he, is he in charge of you? There's a, a verse in Romans 10, 9 and 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. Right, like you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved and then go and fail morally for the rest of your life. I'm joking, that's not what I mean. But I mean that good shepherd, every time you slide off the path is gonna be dragging you back on and dragging you back on, right? Because he loves you, right? And forgive you and like, let's give you a second chance. Let's do a clean slate all over again. Let's just, let's keep at this thing. And that's what he does. And then you lose your way. And some of you lose your way for a few years. And then he's going to come back and he's going to drive you back onto the path. Because that's his way. That's how good he is. He, that's the whole point of Psalm 23. Is he's just a good shepherd and so much about him. And it's so little about us. But man, you got to let him. You got to let him. And coming to church on a Sunday morning is not letting him. 
identifying as a Christian is not letting him. It's different. Uh, Amanda was talking about, she was talking about that song, I'm No Longer a Slave to Fear. And we were singing that. And there's this line, and we're, we're going to sing it again here in a second. There's this line in there. It says, he splits the sea so I can walk right through it. And that's a picture of the children of Israel. Remember when Moses, like Charlton Heston, right? Like, and the waters part. It's this amazing moment. And then they all walk along on dry land. It's this miracle. But I was sitting there and I was, I was singing that. He splits the sea so I can walk right through it. And I just felt like God say, how many Israelites that morning had fights with their spouses? And then they got to walk through on dry land as if they had earned it. They didn't earn it, right? right. It was the miracle of God that he purchased for his people because he loved them. How many people walking across dry land had gotten drunk the night before were literally hung over Israelites walking on dry land, right? Like, it's because it's him. He's the one who does it for us. Amazing grace, amen?